Hi, this is the Magnificent Midlife Podcast and I'm Rachel Lancaster. This is where we celebrate women in midlife and beyond. We challenge the status quo and bash those negative stereotypes about being an older woman. We're not over the hill at 40, 50, 60. We're just getting started. And the world needs us now more than ever. I'll be talking all things midlife, about issues that matter, and sharing fabulous stories of amazing women doing very cool stuff. Now is our time. I'm impossibly excited today to introduce you to Dr. Liz O'Ridden. And I am going to try not to be too fangirl, but you know, it's probably not gonna happen. She is an international speaker, she's a broadcaster, she's an award-winning co-author of The Complete Guide to Breast Cancer. In 2015, when she was aged just 40, she was diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer while working as a consultant breast surgeon. Her life changed dramatically. She's passionate about helping women and especially breast cancer patients. Welcome, Liz. Thank you so much for having me. Now, first of all, I want to say, because I know that you were supposed to get better at saying no to things yes. so that you didn't burn out and you tended to say yes too often. But I am so grateful to you for saying yes to me when I said, please come on my podcast. I so, think it's a really you. important thing to talk about. And so many people are affected by it. So, um, yeah, happy to help. And uh, one of the first things that really struck me as I was reading your book, The Complete Guide to Breast Cancer, Mm -hmm. is that it's not anyone's fault when somebody gets breast cancer. And yet we often, women, think that it is. And why why is that? This is really, really hard to deal with. We know from statistics that have looked at studies of women that if you are overweight, if you drink a lot, if you have an unhealthy lifestyle, your risk of getting cancer is higher. And I drank like a fish at medical school, like most junior doctors did, seriously. But it's very hard to say the reason I got breast cancer was because I drank a lot. Often it's just a combination of changes that happen at some time in your life. And people feel awful when they think it's their fault. And it's not. You can't say it's one thing that you did that caused this. Your lifestyle may have made it more likely to happen. But skinny people still get cancer. Teetotalers still get cancer. And I just wanted to take that blame away and say having cancer is bad enough. You don't need to blame yourself for that. Let's just try and help you move on. Now, I've I've followed you for a long time, but your content on social media recently has, has really sort of drawn me in mm-hmm. because I share your concerns about some of the narratives around HRT. Yeah. And you are particularly concerned about a narrative that HRT is now being described as potentially safe for women who have had breast cancer to Mm -hmm. take. But as you are communicating in your videos and everything that you're doing is that it's nothing is as simple as that. No, You can't just put out a statement like that because there are so many variables. So can you explain to me a little bit about why you're so concerned and, and what are the, some of the things that we need to be thinking about when we see these big statements? How long have you got? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back. As, as a consultant breast surgeon, I never dealt with the menopausal side effects of tamoxifen or the aromatase inhibitors, which lower the amount of estrogen in the body. I would tell women, I'd read the leaflets on breast cancer now, and I'd say, you'll get a bit of vaginal dryness and hot flushes. It normally settles down in time. Off you go. We had a great GP who sat in our clinics who ran a menopausal symptom clinic. I didn't have the time to sit in with her. I assumed the GP dealt with it. I didn't get any training in it. I didn't know other drugs were available to help women with the symptoms. But I could never imagine any woman having extra estrogen. And the reason is estrogen receptor positive cancer kind of gets, it's kind of the one that's left out. There's lots of new drugs coming for her, two positive cancers and triple negative, but estrogen receptor cancers, when they come back, we still have the same old drugs, tamoxifen and astrazole, and it develops resistance and it can kill. And I wouldn't want to give my patients anything that might increase the risk of that happening. Estrogen doesn't cause the breast cancer, but encourages those cells to grow. And then I got breast cancer myself. And I was put into an instant menopause with chemotherapy. And when my cancer came back, I had my surgeries removed. So again, an overnight menopause. And oh my God, 
I thought I'd wet myself because there was sweat trickling down my bum cheek. I thought, oh my God, oh, that's a night sweat. I'm never going to have a full night's sleep again. The flashing and the stripping off, the vaginal dryness, the problems of sex and intimacy overnight. I thought, how on earth am I meant to cope for the next 10 or 15 years? And an incredible oncologist called Richard Simcock tweeted me to say, here's a whole list of other drugs we can give you to help with the symptoms. I had no idea they existed. And so suddenly I was, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, to tell women there are options available. You don't need to put up and shut up. Now, with vaginal estrogen, when I was diagnosed, most doctors said no, no extra estrogen at all. But the Marsden did a study looking at the amount that's absorbed vaginally, and it is tiny. And vaginal estrogen is now 10 micrograms. We used to give 25. And I mm. thought, I need this. As a cyclist, I was getting labial skin tests, riding 100 miles on a bike. It wasn't just sex and intimacy. And I thought, even if there is a tiny risk, it will increase my risk of recurrence. My quality of life is so bad that I want to take that risk. I know it might increase the risk, but I'm going to exercise. I don't drink. So for me, I thought that was fine. But I had to find a doctor who thought it was safe to prescribe it. My GP was fantastic, but a lot of people get battered back and forth. But I knew it was a tiny dose and I knew that risk. Now, a lot of women don't have educated GPs or breast surgeons like me. They don't know there's help available. They don't know where to go. They don't know what websites to go on. It's a minefield. And most of us will go to social media for information. And there, there is a narrative that HRT could be safe after breast cancer. We can talk about the details of the research and trials, but my concern is a lot of women are hearing it might be safe and it's good for you and it will stop you dying of heart disease and dementia and it's fantastic. And they're not being told that there are studies that say it has shown an increase in recurrence. Now, none of the studies are great, but women need to know we don't know whether it's safe or not. So you can take that decision because if your breast cancer comes back and you took HRT, are you OK to live with that guilt? that you or your family might experience. And I don't care if every woman takes it, but I want her to know about all the alternatives and the benefits of improving your lifestyle. And if she's willing to accept that real risk of an early death, that's fine. But I don't think that message is getting across. And there's some dodgy data out there, isn't there? I mean, I there is. personally, I've talked on my podcast already about there's this 900,000 women have left work because of menopause yeah. statistic. And I went digging for that and I found out it was just, it's not true. It's just not true. How many women could afford to leave work and lose their pension <laughs> because of the menopause? I think they'd like to. Yeah. But you've, you've been digging, haven't you? Yeah. You've been doing what I do. And because I like to go back to the original research because often you, and this is what I wrote about. You see um, a link and it goes to another link, which you think might be the research, but sometimes it's just another article and you, and then it's another article and you go around and around in circles. When I did my PhD looking into thyroid cancer, if I was using a scientific article, I had to read it and critique it and explain why I was using it to back up my theory and what was good and what was bad about it. If you write a book or you write an article, you don't have to read all the papers that you reference. There's no law. You may have seen one person said it and that was repeated and repeated and repeated. So I'll just rewrite what they said about the study and put it in the book. And when journalists report on a new paper in The Lancet saying HRT is great, they don't have to read the full study. They can just take the press PR spin. So just because someone has quoted a study doesn't mean they've read it or they believe it. There's no way of knowing that. And most of us will think, oh, wow, there's loads of papers in this. It must be true. Look at all the evidence. And I thought there's one book written by an American oncologist called Avram Blooming. It's called Estrogen Matters. And it's promoted a lot in the menopause online space. Why HRT cures everything. Estrogen is the savior. You have to have it. And I've had so many women send me awful messages feeling they're being forced to have it in Irish Facebook groups, in UK communities. They don't want it. Why is it being forced on them? So I thought, right, I'm going to look at this data. And Dr. Blumming says there are 25 studies that have been done looking at HRT. There aren't many, but he says most of them show it's neutral or safe. And I went back. And they're often done in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, <laughs> 80s, 90s, 20, 30, 40 years old. And a lot of them aren't done to actually look at HRT. They're looking at the treatment of breast cancer. A lot of them 
only use women who are already two or three years down the line after treatment. And this is really important because if breast cancer is going to come back. It's in the first couple of years or it's 10, 20, 30 years later, like Olivia Newton-John. But if you make it to five years, your chance of making it for 10, 20, 30 is much, much better. So by only picking women who've been treated for two or three years, you've got rid of everyone who had an early recurrence. So the women you're looking at are less likely to have a bad outcome. And most trials only followed women up for a couple of years. But we know, like Olivia Newton-John, it can come back 30 years later. So if you say there were no increase in events after three years, well, so what? We know, and a lot of the trials didn't tell us whether those women had estrogen sensitive cancers or not. So you can't say HRT helped if they're all triple negative because those cancers aren't driven by estrogen. And when you delve down, we don't have good data to show that HRT might be safe. Ah, oh, this is just so important. So now, important. on the and other I side, people to know. There, there, there are a couple of trials and I've not done my deep dive in them. So I'm not hot on the stats that showed HRT could increase the risk of recurrence. And again, they weren't long follow ups. But, the, but the one trial was stopped early because they were concerned about this. And the people like Dr. Blooming, who poo poo this study, say it only showed local recurrence. And that's not the same as death or metastases. Here's the thing. I had an early local recurrence. And yes, local recurrence can be cured, it can be cut out, it doesn't mean my cancer is going to come back. But if you have an early local recurrence, you're almost four times more likely, I think that's right, definitely much more likely to get metastatic disease and die in the future. It's almost a marker that your cancer is worse than someone else. So the fact that it didn't show an increase in death doesn't matter. The increase in local recurrence is more likely to lead to an increase in death. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they can't say, oh, it's just local recurrence. It doesn't mean anything. No, it really does. Those women are more likely to get metastatic disease in the future. And honestly, I'm. You can interpret the evidence any way you like to make it fit your hypothesis, your opinion, your story. Mm. And there's, I don't think there is ever going to be a good trial to compare a group of a thousand women with stage one ear positive breast cancer and say half of you are having HRT for five years, half of you aren't, and we're going to follow you up for 10 years. It's never going to happen. Mm. So we may never have accurate data. All we have are bad trials. But women need to know that there were some trials that showed it was good and some, well, they didn't, and some trials that showed it was bad. And the other thing is, of course, is that the formulations have changed yes. completely. And the formulations are different in different places. You know, there are very few people getting, uh, he describes it, what is he? I call it Primarin. Mm. And he says Premarin, Premarin, mm. doesn't he? There's very few women in the UK getting that. But when I first started talking on social about Premarin in my own personal Facebook group, somebody said, oh, I'm on that. And this was only sort of like six, seven yeah. years ago. Um, and yet now, you know, we have different formulations. Women are on different strengths. And, and we can get into that as well, that people, you know, are talking about the being prescribed too much, yeah. going beyond the, the, the nice guidelines. But it's it's comparing apples with pears, isn't it? Because one, the formulations are so different, but also... What what gets me is when people talk about, you know, we have evidence that this is safe long term. We don't. We don't. We're only now. I mean, I talk about having, you know, I'm the pill generation. Yeah. Um, I went on it as soon as I possibly could. And who knows whether that might have impacted my diagnosis of early menopause. Yeah. I'll never know. But so there's there's that as well that we we can't say definitively, and I think that that's where you and I, we agree, is that by all means we can say possibly or maybe, but we can't definitively make these statements. It's just not, not ethical to do that, I no. don't think. I really don't. Every woman has the right to take what she wants. It's her body, and doctors have to realise that that's okay. We are not the ones living with that risk, the fear of recurrence, which I did as a breast cancer surgeon. And I think my fear would be worse than any woman I was seeing as a doctor because I've looked after young women who have died of metastatic breast cancer. Most of my patients will have never seen anybody go through that and they can't imagine what it's like. But as long as a woman knows that 
the position statement from the Royal Colleges of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, Association of Breast Surgeons, British Menopause Society, Society of Endocrinologists says that HRT should not be routinely recommended for women with breast cancer unless it's exceptional circumstances. They know that because we believe it can increase the risk of recurrence. And they've tried all the other alternative drugs available. They've done lifestyle measures, exercise, cutting at alcohol, and their quality of life is so bad that they're willing to take the risk of recurrence. Then I think it's fine if they have HRT, but we just need to make sure women have been told all of that yeah. first. We can't make blanket statements, can we? It has to be, it no. has to be everything in And context. it is complicated. And this breast cancer and this breast cancer, so we don't know if you had a bit of DCIS, so non-invasive breast cancer, and you're 65, the chance of that becoming metastatic in the future is very, very small. But a young woman who's 35 with a large stage 3 triple neg- large stage 3 ER positive ca- breast cancer with positive lymph nodes, her risk of met are much, much higher. And I'd be really concerned if women who'd had chemo were being recommended HRT because their risk of recurrence is so much higher. So I think it's really important your private menopause specialist, whoever you're seeing, fully understands your own risks of recurrence for your individual breast cancer. Yeah. And people can't do that unless they're a specialist as well. I mean, exactly. And it can be difficult because oncologists are probably going to say, no, you shouldn't take it because we've looked after women where it's come back. We are very, very risk averse. Whereas a menopause specialist may be saying, no, no, it's fine. Trust me, you'll be fine. And you're, you're left in the middle and you don't know who to believe. And that's where it's really, really hard for women. Um, and there is no easy answer. But I think women need to know why the doctors are not recommending it. The, the cancer specialists on the whole are not recommending it. But that's also why your voice is so powerful, because you, you've had breast cancer. You've had all the treatment. You yeah. are a breast cancer surgeon or you were a breast cancer surgeon um, and you have a PhD and you've done the research yeah. as well. So, yeah. that, and, you know, I hadn't thought that through until you told me earlier. So, yeah, you're you're the person to listen to. So everybody just listen to Liz. <laughs> oh, I'm just I'm just trying to explain the evidence so women can understand. Yeah. I used to tell my patients, don't go on Google. I'll give you a load of information. It's bullshit, pardon my French, because it's the first place I went. <laughs> I bought 10 books written by breast cancer patients to understand what it was like. And that's me being a consultant breast mm. surgeon. The first place we go for information now is often Instagram or Twitter. And it's very easy to believe what you see. And it, it's crazy how if someone has 100,000 followers, you're more likely to think they're telling the truth. You're more likely to believe them rather than a doctor who's got 2,000 followers, who's putting out incredible content, but because they're not famous, people don't don't listen to them. And it's really hard how your expertise is based on how popular you are, not your qualifications. And I don't know the way around that. It's really, really hard. Keep on going, I think. Keep on going. Because eventually... (sighs) I think if you're consistent, that's uh, that's what my husband always says to me. You just just stick to the line, stick to the line, keep going, yeah. keep going, you know, and don't. And again, I do this. I'm not paid to do this. No. I do this in my free time because <laughs> I just want to help people. And think if I can explain research and help someone understand, then that's great. They don't have to listen to me. It's nice if they do. But it's it's a really strange world where social media is changing how patients are treated. They have access. So it's amazing as a patient, you can follow conferences all over the world telling you the latest updates in your individual cancer or your illness you have access to so much information now that was always kept behind locked doors of the doctor's Mm. office so it is opening things Mm. up it's a shame sometimes when as you you described a recent video something's behind a paywall because a lot of people are not then going to pay to go and do that and that that is annoying it annoys me sometimes there was an article in the British Medical Journal recently sort of talking about the over medicalization of menopause and I would have loved that to have been available freely for women to read it was initially but then it went behind a paywall so then they just get the the top paragraph the the abstract abstract. and it 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 doesn't doesn't work it doesn't and then that gets quoted out of context and and the whole ethos of the article is lost, which is a real shame. Yeah. But I mean, that just going back to my 900,000 figure, that was quoted in a UK parliamentary inquiry. You would think it was yeah. correct. The civil would, service put in place a menopause in the workplace initiative and quoted that figure in their press release. <laughs> and it's not true. It's not true. No. So 
<laughs> and most women with the menopause actually cope quite well. The symptoms do get mm-hmm. better in time. That's the same for women taking tamoxifen. It's a bit like TripAdvisor. The people who are yes. ra- raging the most about a bad restaurant are the ones who go on and complain. But most people, a bit like medicine, I'll get, I got letters of complaints, people trying to sue me. They're a handful, but they, oh, they really, really hurt. The vast majority of people I treated thought I was great, couldn't be asked to tell me, and a couple sent you a card. It's the same with the menopause. Mm. I believe most women, they know it's not great, but they get mm. through it. But there are some who really struggle. And if they the ones are making the noise and making out to be much, much bigger than it is. Mm-hmm. Just a thought. I agree with you on that. I absolutely agree. I, I think that, you know, the negative experiences, then there's a tendency that they become the blueprint for the rest of us. And, and it doesn't need to be that way. And I think it's also scary. So, th- again, the, the guidelines from the Royal Colleges all say that HRT should not be prescribed to prevent disease. It's not designed for that. But there's a new narrative coming through that HRD will stop you getting dementia or heart disease or osteoporosis or diabetes or all these kind of Alzheimer's. things. Alzheimer's. It's not depression. It's not designed for that. No. And this is because women who are old get Alzheimer's. Therefore, it must be the menopause. Therefore, HRT can stop that. That's like saying women with breasts get breast cancer and women who have breasts wear bras. Therefore, bras cause breast cancer. <laughs> there are so many other factors. But... People who follow me with breast cancer who don't want to take HRT are terrified they are going to die of Alzheimer's and heart disease because they're not taking HRT. And again, the message from all the medical societies is you give HRT to help with menopausal symptoms, not to prevent disease. It may be a tiny bonus of taking it, but you don't prescribe it for that reason. And what's the biggest thing you can do to reduce your risk of dementia and Alzheimer's and heart disease and osteoporosis? exercise Shall I tell you healthy lifestyle changes that are free and have no side effects I, t- I tell you something going back to the estrogen matters book um I, I mm-hmm. was I was staggered in fact I have it up here on a screenshot because I wanted to mention it um it really does seem to be a very dodgy peculiar book I have to say mm. but um I was reading it this morning in preparation and uh He says, while exercise may improve bone strength and resistance to fracture, this is obviously in the in the um, chapter on osteoporosis, while exercise may improve bone strength and resistance to fracture in premenopausal women. However, it does not improve bone strength or resistance to fracture among postmenopausal women who are not on HRT. What? That, that's the, I'm going to have to go and dig that's in. What he's, that that's ever, what he's... That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And I think that is either... I can't remember now, but it's either from 1951 or from 1991. I think it's 91. But even so... Excellent. It's 91. And even when Mariella Fostrup did her documentary on menopause about four years ago now, they did a test amongst three groups of women... And the women who were running, you know, had the highest bone density. And then I was thinking, am I going mad? Yeah. Is bone density, does that not help with bone strength? I thought, you know, I know it I'm does. not an expert. It's... I don't know. But I thought, does that make sense? No. No, it doesn't. doesn't. Does it? Your bones, to improve the strength of your bones, you need calcium and vitamin D in your diet. And you need weight bearing exercise. So cycling and swimming and yoga don't really count. You need to put force through the bones and you need to be doing ideally some weight training as well to help build up the muscle to keep the bones strong. Estrogen does delay osteoporosis. Um, We know that. And it will help a little bit if you're on HRT. But the biggest thing you can do is exercise. It's weight bearing exercise. That is awful. And so many people will I'm just, have to will go just read at, that. That's another video I need to do now. Yeah. <laughs> they'll look at that. And yeah. believe. I, but they'll also believe I don't need to exercise. Yes. yes. Exercise can reduce the risk of you getting cancer, reduce the risk of it coming back. So basically, if I, there are no side if effects. I take the HRT, I can carry on drinking. Yeah. I can carry on having all the caffeine. I can yeah. have the sugar. I don't need to exercise. All the cakes. All the cakes carry no, on with the stress. It will save you. But I'll be fine because I'll have the HRT. <laughs> at what cost? How much are you paying to see someone to give you this? It's just, oh. I'm really scared at the narrative of how people are now saying it's a deficiency syndrome. It's not. Again, the Royal Colleges say menopause is not a deficiency. It's a natural state when women's bodies stop 
being able to have children. We don't call midlife crisis in men a testosterone deficiency syndrome. They just get on with it. Well, when 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 did that menopause deficiency syndrome? Um, when did that narrative start? It it, I'm it not started sure. I've only with become... this. I'm oh, holding up there. Feminine by? Forever okay. by uh, Robert A. Wilson. By a by man. man. Oh, yes. yes Lovely. He was in the pay of the uh, drug companies. It was subsequently found out. And this book, this book was published in the year of my birth, 1966. And um, it was a roaring success. And uh, <laughs> he made a lot of money. And the drug companies I made a lot of did. money. And this was about that it was a hormone deficiency. And that women needed to take HRT forever to remain feminine forever. And that's where, and so, oh my and I'm 56 God. years old. So in 56 years, has the narrative not moved on? It has medically, but there are still menopause specialists who are plugging the issue that it's a deficiency that we need. It, it's natural. Your ovaries stop working when your body can't cope with you being pregnant. It happens naturally. Like men naturally produce less testosterone. It's, it's called aging. Yeah. <laughs> it happens to it's, us all. It's called aging. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just. Yeah. And I tell you what, you know, I'm 56. <sighs> I don't take synthetic estrogen. I do take a little bit of local estrogen because I have problems with vaginal dryness mm -hmm. too. Um, but I don't feel deficient. I really don't no. feel deficient. And I am personally doing lots of other things to help me not succumb to Alzheimer's, heart disease, osteoporosis, diabetes. Which are? What are you doing? What am I doing? I'm taking good care of myself. So I manage my stress much better than I used to before I got the early menopause diagnosis. I don't have any caffeine. I've recently stopped drinking completely, actually. I'm, I'm eight weeks without mm -hmm. any booze, which is, I'm feeling really good about. Um, I have improved my diet so that um, not just having a better diet, but thinking about when I'm eating so that my blood sugar levels don't fluctuate and put yeah. stress onto my body in that respect. Um, I have lots of phytoestrogens. I know you're not a fan of phytoestrogens, but I have a lot of those, a lot of flax and soy and things, not as supplements, but as actual food. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, all of that. And I, I feel good. I'm all right. And I'm not, you know. For most women, it's simple, healthy, boring lifestyle measures that will just help you cope whilst your body gets used to it and then settles down into your postmenopausal state. Mm. And uh, because if you go on HRT, you're going to have to stop it at some point, and then you're going to go through all the symptoms. Like you're going to have to go through this anyway, because it's not safe to be on it until you're eighty or ninety. Oh, I don't think it is. I really. You're don't. delaying the inevitable, and surely you're more like you're better. You're you're more going to be more able to cope with the symptoms of the menopause if they're bad in your fifties compared to your seventies or eighties. Who knows? It's it's just it's just become this big huge issue and. It's just, it shouldn't no, be. No, it shouldn't be. It really shouldn't People be. People are making money. It's like the latest, there's a book or an app or someone's coming out making money off the menopause. Well. <laughs> it's the latest thing to cash in on, isn't it? In my latest solo podcast, I talked about how um, the Female Founders Fund, I think it was a couple of years ago, they did their research, don't know how, but they came up with the fact that the menopause market is a 600 billion US dollar market opportunity for companies. Yeah. I'm not surprised. All the supplements, mm -hmm. all this that you need mm -hmm. and that that you need. It's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, while I have you here, I, I, I could yes. talk about this forever, but I would love to also um, talk about, you know, your journey, your experience. Um, mm -hmm. And so <sighs> cancer has cost you an awful lot, hasn't it? Yeah. I noticed that you haven't written anything on your blog since you wrote the blog where you had to stop being a surgeon. No. And I know you've got a book coming out. So I wonder, have you been have you been writing for the book? Have you just not been publishing or have you not been writing? And how have you adapted to giving up, you know, what was such an important yeah. part of your life and that you'd spent so long getting to that stage? I can't imagine what it must have been like for you. No one's ever asked me that before, so thank oh. you. Um, 
I started the blog back in 2015 to make breast cancer seem real because I was in denial. It couldn't be happening. My husband was the tech guy on Twitter and said, just start a blog. It's the latest thing. And it was a way of explaining to my mum and dad who lived in Scotland and my brother lived in Switzerland what was happening to me because they lived miles away. And then I discovered that patients and doctors were reading it and saying thank you because I was explaining what was happening with my doctor head on to try and not exaggerate it or make it extreme, just saying this is what's happening. I want you to know what it's really like. And that led to me being asked to do talks all over the world. And that kind of gave me a new life. But when my breast cancer came back in 2018 on my chest wall, the side effects of more surgery and more radiotherapy meant I couldn't use my left arm properly. I can't lift it straight up in the air. And that meant I could no longer operate. I could not be a breast cancer surgeon. And in some ways it was a relief because having had it twice, I didn't think ethically I could cope dealing with patients. But I didn't choose to quit. I couldn't remember my last operation because I didn't realise it would be my last. And suddenly at the age of 43, I was left home alone all day. My social life, my reason to get up in the morning had gone. My salary had gone. My pension was tiny. I thought, what the hell do I do? And at that time, I kind of stopped writing a blog because I was depressed. I just, I don't know what to do with my life. I'm a breast surgeon. I have no hobbies. I spent my life, 40 years training to, to treat people. And I just kind of had this six months of working out what the hell do I do with my life? I need a purpose. I need to bring a bit more money in. How am I going to occupy my days? My friends are miles away. It was really, really, really hard. And I, the book had just come out. So there was a bit of publicity and some talks and writing about that. And I realized that I can still help people by tweeting. And I wrote a few articles for the Daily Mail talking about, you know, mental health and my sex life and how to improve death and dying. And I just count, kind of found little bits of the web where I could reach out and I'm passionate about, really about improving patient care. And I didn't have the time to keep up the blog, but I thought, well, my cancer journey's done, I've moved on. But now, I felt I've got a story to tell. There have been quite a few medical memoirs that have come out, like Adam Kay's, which is all over the news. And I thought I was a female surgeon. I was a woman in a man's world in the 90s, going through sexual harassment and bullying and being a single woman in her 30s with no social life, turning to alcohol. How do you cope? I think that's a really interesting story about what it was like then. The imposter syndrome. Am I good enough? And then... When I became a consultant breast surgeon, I didn't realize how hard it was to tell 10 women a day they have breast cancer. The stress of dealing with that emotion made me suicidal twice. And I'd just gone back to work and then I got breast cancer. And I thought if I can share my story and help people cope, learn, see how I coped, see how there is a way forward, it might be another way of helping people. So that's coming out next year with Unbound. It's called Under the Knife. You can pre-order it now. It's called, yeah, with Unbound, it's called Under the Knife. And I'm going to resurrect my blog. I'm going to start putting all my videos on there because people ask me, have you done a video on tamoxifen? <laughs> Let me scroll back through the feed. So I'm going to make my website now an index of all the videos so people can go and see where I've been explaining things. But it's, I'm happier. I'm stronger. I feel healthier. I realize there are many different ways to help people and I'm slowly learning to help myself to do things for me and to have time to read and to help out hedgehogs and just <laughs> be a more balanced person. It's funny. I'm a, I'm honestly happier now having had cancer twice than I was when I was a breast surgeon. I guess you had to stop, didn't you? You just had to stop and rethink everything. Yeah. It was just my my life, my purpose for being for 20 years to be a consultant breast cancer surgeon was taken away from me. The problem I have now is by being so open and accessible on social media, I get lots of requested messages every day from women all over the world asking for help. And I want to help them because I'm a doctor, it's what I do. But I have to think I can spend five hours on my phone every day replying to strangers, whereas I'm not writing my book or I'm not talking to my own friends. And it's really hard to find that balance of supporting the incredible community of people who help crowdfund my book and then saying actually I don't owe them an instant answer mm. and that's what I find really hard mm. you're gonna to have to work on that though aren't you <laughs> I know I kind of it's it's, it's I'm trying to a find a bigger the picture and we need that bigger picture from you yeah we do and, and I love doing I love doing the videos I love doing it out there but it's kind of hoping people won't mind if I don't reply to all their comments it's not mm. that I I'm not grateful it's just I don't have the time but I do read them all and it's 
I really enjoy what I'm doing. But again, it's it's thinking I could spend two days a week researching for Instagram. And again, I don't get paid for doing that. I'm not doing what I want in that time. And I think all of us need to find that balance and have time when you put yourself first. And again, you take out the stress, you exercise, you look after yourself. It's really, really important. Mm. It's so important. And that will help with everybody's menopause as well. Most mm, of the time. Definitely. Most of the time. It's so funny that you should mention the hedgehogs because I have on my list of questions here. Tell me about the hedgehogs. <laughs> so I, I am one of those people who can't watch the end of, Dum- of Dumbo. If an animal cries in a film, I'm out the door. I can't, I just, I can't deal with it. Um, and I saw a baby hedgehog out in the day, out in the garden one day, and I knew they shouldn't be out in the day. And I found a local hedgehog shelter. Um, as you do. Around the corner from me. And I took this little, as you do. Well, I was desperate. So it's, there's a big one at Mrs. Tiggy Winkles was shut. The RSPCA said we don't take hedgehogs. So what am I going to do? This tiny little thing. And I found a local one after about three Google search screen swipes. And it's run by a couple in their 70s who just started with a couple that their daughter had found. And they had about 300 hedgehogs that they look after in their kind of porch in a garage. It's a tiny charity. They do it all themselves. They don't get any money for doing it. And when the baby hog- hoglets come in, they need to be fed every couple of hours. So they they change them twice a day. They're often feeding them. It's, it's a huge amount of work. So I took them this baby hedgehog and they they looked after it and I released it back into my garden the next year. And then I thought, I've got time now to help. I want to do something meaningful where I'm not asking, not getting anything in return. Although I do get to hold baby hedgehog pictures and put that on social media. But just <laughs> giving my time for free to help someone. So every Tuesday morning I go along and I muck out hedgehogs. There's about 20 to 40 and they pee and they poo all over their bedding and their food. And I just Outrageous. wipe all the muck away. It's <laughs> filthy. But I, it's just how they've got a baby pigeon at the minute it's called Percy. And they've got a blind squirrel that can never be released that they're looking after. And it's just I'm giving something back. And then I put water out for the hedgehogs in my own garden. I put cat food out in a little hedgehog box. It's so important to put water out for wildlife at the moment because it's hot. That's a lecture over. But it's just my way of giving something back. And it's one of the best times of my week. Brilliant. Brilliant. I love hedgehogs. I haven't been able to Me entice too. them into my London garden. Don't know that there are any around here. But, uh, ah. And often because they can travel two or three kilometres in, in a night. And if there aren't gaps in the they fences for them through. to go looking for food, they can't. Yeah. No. No, I don't. I think I don't think they're in my area, sadly. But I had a, I had a swift come down the other day. Yeah, and I was I was ringing round for Swift Rescue, and sadly, by the time I'd found somebody, um, Swift had died, which was a bit sad. Oh, sometimes you need to throw them violently up into the air because they don't have the legs to push off mm. again to launch. This one was, mm, I think it was, it was yeah. poorly. Oh, yeah. but I think, and the, the the Swift Rescue lady was telling me that the roofs have been so hot that the birds yeah. nesting on the roof or under the roof it's just been too hot so they've left too early you know they fledged too early or oh god i hadn't or thought about just that had to get off the roof yeah. because it's just too hot because they're burning yeah. oh my god yeah. there's all sorts of ramifications of a heat wave see it's not just us menopausal women suffering in the heat with the hot flashes <laughs> <laughs> everybody is yeah and you craft as well don't you the dressmaking I tell do. me about that my mum my mum taught me to knit and crochet and we used to do a load of cross stitches until we ran out of spare walls in our house to hang them all. And then um, I, I started making my own clothes because I thought I have too many clothes and I buy them and I don't wear them and I throw them away. And there's so much clothing waste and fabric waste, the whole fast fashion, Primark, New Look. I thought this is really bad. I'm going to only buy, I'm only going to make clothes that I need, that I want, that I know that will fit. And I taught myself off YouTube and it was a bit like, the surgeon in me but what I, I hate the finishing I hate tying in the loose ends I need a junior doctor to come along and make them look pretty and then when I had my mastectomy and I lost my breast it's nice being able to fit and alter clothes so they don't gape and it's it's fun you wear something different that no one else has my husband thinks my fabric stash is free and I'm sticking to that <laughs> don't tell him oh it's lovely and you have created some amazing things I've seen them on on your socials but just beautiful yeah it's just it's my way of still being Mm. a surgeon and still sewing and thinking that part of my brain and just how a piece of fabric can create something amazing Mm. all from YouTube anybody could do it you're never too old to start and you're also really passionate about exercise aren't you which is funny because I hated exercise so did I 
I I couldn't throw a ball or hit I couldn't do anything in my life. And I blame it. I was learned to play the piano. So I, I, I was used to knowing where my hands me were too. without me looking at them. So I wouldn't look at a ball. Last to be picked. I, I avoided PE in the sixth form by digging out mucky ponds in a local abbey. I hated it. I joined a gym every time I moved hospitals, gave him a thousand pounds, never went back because I didn't have the time. <laughs> and then my husband took up cycling and I became a cycling widow. And I thought if I don't cycle, I will never see him. And that led to us doing the 100 mile ride in London. And then I got bored of cycling and I thought I swam. I used to swim. I had shoulders because I used to breaststroke when I was a teenager. And I ran the London Marathon very slowly. So I got into triathlon and I'd just done my first when I was diagnosed. And I thought, I really like exercise. It makes me feel free. And I carried on training through treatment before we knew it was good for you then, because that was the one time I was Liz. I wasn't a breast cancer Mm. patient. It wasn't, oh, bless her. I wasn't a bold woman through chemo. I was just mm. Liz. And we now know that exercise improves all the symptoms of breast cancer treatment, physical and mental, and it halves the risk of recurrence. And it improves your bone health. And ideally, we should be doing aerobic and weightlifting two or three times a week just for, and most of us don't do it. Most doctors don't do it. I have weeks where I fall off the wagon, but it's just that sense of I'm looking after me. You get the endorphins ready. I feel better. But it's hard and it's easy for people to think, but look at her, she's tall and slim. It's easy for her. I'm overweight. I have a busy job. I can't do it. I get how hard Mm. it is. And it's like a dirty word, exercise. It It sounds like hard work. Yeah, It's really hard to put on a pair of trainers and put a podcast in and get out the door and move. It is really, really hard to take the first step. Talking of podcasts, you started a podcast too, haven't you? I you're have. not, you're not exactly have. sitting on your backside doing nothing, are you? <laughs> no, I'm bored. My brain needs to work. I, I thought I've spent most of lockdown talking about the things no one talks about, like sex after breast cancer and death. And I thought, everyone's got a podcast. I want in on the game. Let's see. <laughs> no money. I found an incredible team of women who are a social enterprise who are helping me um, and just got some amazing I guests know. like Catherine Mannix yeah, some... and Catherine Greg Wise Mannix. talking about Catherine she's Mannix. been on me at mine twice I've had it twice she uh. <laughs> I was terrified of dying until I read her book and she talked yeah. to me and people talking about bulimia and body image and just the stuff people don't talk mm. about and I think because I share so much of my own story I can get guests to share their own personal stories knowing we can help mm. people and I'm about to start recording season two which will come out September October with some great topics to cover it's just it's just another way of helping people. And the letters from women, especially after the sex episode, saying, I cried when I heard you talk about how bad it was and that help was available. And I listened to it with my husband and we are now trying again. I thought, that's, if I can help exactly, one person, exactly. it's worth carrying yeah. on. Yeah, it's brilliant. But I mean, you've had Jane Garvey on and your first guest was Greg Wise. I, know. I was just thinking, blimey, this is just, just serious oh, big so time. Greg Wise, this is a story. <laughs> Greg and Catherine are patrons of the charity End of Life Doulas oh. to get people to come into your home and look after you at the end of your life, like a birthing mm-hmm, doula. Mm-hmm. We don't plan for death at all. And they had a charity auction, and one of the prizes was win cocktails for two with Greg Wise. But, oh, I loved him in Willoughby. I'm up for that. Assuming someone would outbid me, but nobody did. And then lockdown hit, so I ended up having virtual cocktails with Greg Wise and Catherine Mannix. That's so cool. Wow. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Catherine Mannix as well. I mean, and I listened to her second book, Listen. Oh, that's She's brilliant, She's just the perfect it? storyteller. Yeah. And her voice, I could listen to her voice forever. She's, it's amazing. It's like a cup of tea for the soul. <laughs> yes, it You really just is. know everything is going to be all right. Yeah. And she, she helped me get over my fear of dying. She told me what actually happens. And it's like, okay, mm-hmm. I can accept that. I'm ready for it. And I think a lot of people who are scared of cancer coming back or scared of getting any illness are actually scared of dying because we don't talk about it. Yeah. And if through her work we can help, that's going to be a huge thing. Mm-hmm. And something else that's happened to you recently, I, which I can't really believe, but your, your mum has had her arm amputated because of cancer, hasn't she? And I can't imagine she has. How, how has that been for you watching I mean your mother had to watch you yeah and now you've had to watch her I always thought it would be me who had metastatic breast cancer I would be the person affected next not my mum getting it and it was really really hard I think it's almost harder for me to be a carer 
than to be the cancer patient. Because when I had cancer, I just went, I had to go through chemo. I had no choice. And my husband, who's a doctor, said he felt impotent. And I get that because I can't help my mum. I can't make her better. She had a really rare cancer, a, a bone cancer of her right arm. Um, only 4,000 are diagnosed in a year in the UK. Only five hospitals treat it. It's that rare. And the only real option to give her the best chance of survival was to have her right arm amputated. And she's right handed. And in your 70s, to learn to live with your, your left hand is a huge thing. And I just felt sick at the thought of how is she going to cope? How is my dad going to cope? What's going to happen to her? You, I went through the whole, she'll be dead in two months, sarcoma is really bad, all of this. Googling, having told her not to, but it's so rare there's nothing to see and making myself sick with worry. But she's come through the operation and she's I mean, amazing. She, the night before Boris Johnson resigned, she put a tweet out saying, um, dear Mr. Johnson, I'm having my right arm removed to save my body. Will you remove yourself from being prime minister to save the country? And she now calls herself a one-armed bandit. I know. And she's I putting know. lipstick on with her left hand and she made scones with her left hand. She made spaghetti bolognese last night just using her wrong hand. She's incredible. And she's mm. just found this... Everyone thinks she's brave, but she's not. She's just coping, which is kind mm. of what I did. And it's weird mm. to see the admiration I feel for her, thinking, ah, oh, that's what people thought about me. But both of us just think, we're just getting on because we have no choice. Mm. We don't prepare ourselves for our parents dying. We no. don't talk about it, which is another huge, that's a whole other podcast episode, but yeah, it's been hard. Yeah, I can imagine. I've said we're two careless women because I lost my breast and she lost her arm. If you find them, let us know. <laughs> Goodness me. <laughs> Humour does help. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's oh fine. my we have goodness. To yeah. Wow. But yeah, I've seen her on Twitter. She she's as amazing as you, I think. Yeah, the pair of you, pretty pretty darn incredible, really. I know where I get it from. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Well, I could I could talk to you for I know. You know, hours and hours, but <laughs> I know we don't again. <laughs> we don't have that. Maybe we'll have a return visit. Yeah. But um, this this is this has just been amazing, and I I'm so pleased to have encountered you through social, and I'm just watching to see what you do next because I know it's going to be well worth watching and well worth oh, taking part of in you, you know. But I would encourage everybody listening to this to to really follow Liz because you don't have to have had breast cancer or be in the, I haven't, you know, and I don't have it in my, actually I had an aunt who had breast cancer, but I don't have it in my, certainly my immediate, immediate family, but that doesn't matter because I, you know, you have many, many titles, but I now think you should have this sort of like um, truth crusader <laughs> title as well, because you Myth are. Mythbuster. Mythbuster. Yeah. You and me, we're the Mythbusters. Absolutely. <laughs> because there are so many myths and there's so much manipulation of information and data and you and I, we are both incensed by it and we are both motivated to make sure that women get the the right information so yeah. I think I'm gonna just I'm gonna ask you what what would you most like women to know today I want you to question everything you're being told and think about the person who's given you information there's a test by a guy called Skylar Johnson called the crap test is the claim too good to be true if it was true then every single doctor would be telling you it is the research unbiased is the research done by pharma companies? Is, are they telling you the good research and the bad research is what they want? Are they making money off whatever they're selling you? And just take that into account and remember, just because someone's a doctor doesn't mean they are a specialist in the area they're talking about. And trust your gut. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Magnificent Midlife Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, follow and share it. Also, giving a five-star review really helps get the word out. You'll find the show notes at magnificentmidlife.com. That's also where you can get my book, Magnificent Midlife, Transform Your Middle Years, Menopause and Beyond. Make the very best of your next chapter. Help me change the world, one magnificent midlife woman at a time.